namin yan. According sa picture, itong last set yung hindi natin. Saka ba dito, dito? Yeah. Okay. 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 So, ito na tayo in-order ko. Ito prefer ka pa pa. Ito ko na rin po eh. Hindi, hindi, hindi. Hindi, hindi, hindi. Hindi, hindi, hindi. Hindi, hindi, hindi. Nakachecky na ako sa NSTN ko at nilalaman ko na yung mga labahan ko dahil ano uh, naman, hindi ko na yung damit ko and kailangan meron akong masuot para mga pang OOTD at saka para fresh naman yung away ko dito, di ba? Okay lang po ulit ang mahalaga fresh. Dito si NSTN ko sa Osakabe uh, o GK Hostel. Mura lang yung kanilang laundry para 200 yen lang kasama na yung sabon plus another 100 lang for 30 minutes of dryer. Sa matala sa ibang lugar kasi 300, tapos excluded pa doon yung sabon. So ito, this budget friendly na. Kakitikta na tingin ito paano. So, for now, tingnan naman natin yung binili ko ng mga Mr. Donut dito. Tara. Hello. So, ano ba yung sa aming common area? Wala sa doon tao. Ako lang. Tsaka yung mga Japanese dito. So, carry lang. Tara, mag-video tayo habang hindi ako na awkward. Kasi so, maraming tao may so, Kaya titingin na nila ako, tsaka yung iba. Dahil pag may mga matanda, medyo sensitive sila. Ito yung nagkatalang nila. Lakit ang wala naman ako matanda. So ito na rin binigay ko sa 
si Sedona, so excited na excited ako dito. Dahil nakakatawa kanina. Ooh. Pero hindi pala na yung mga pangalan ko pinamili ko. Pero so, habang nandiyan na ba tayo, at mag-edit yung talaga ako. Ay, parang mga nalakang nyo.
walang discrimination. Ano yung, pag mayroon, hindi ka, di ba, I don't speak the language. Hindi sila nagagalit. Kasi okay lang sila, hindi sila yung na-accident na ako. Sobrang respect ko lang mga tao. So yun yung gusto ko gusto ko talaga. Like, sa service, sa hospitality yung gusto nyo walang sa restaurant, sa ganyan, kakain ako. Mabait na mga tao. Mabait. Tapos, Meron mga ibang may dumatatabang, mga may itong quick review, hindi masarap. Huwag <laughs> natin para kapagalit, huwag natin tama, huwag eh. natin i-describe ng details, kasi both of them, hindi masarap. Pero, generally, nakijoy sa mga pagkain dito. Masarap tumatalay kasi. So, pero, ito sabi, very tourist tayo, ano, 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 Baka meron ka hindi nakuntahan dito, comment down below, for, for sure. Kasi, hindi ko pa, tao lang din yan, tao lang din. Baka, kaya ko lang ikutin. Okay. Ito sabang lang dito. Yung mga gitsi ko sa sabang lang dito. Yung mga 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 lang lang dito. Ang laman. Kasi, yung mga lang dito. Ano? Yung mga lang dito. Ay, ang gawa nila. Dito pa ang gawa na. Ang gawa na pa nga kami, hindi nga pa. Ngayon ba sa Japan? Kung marutong na hindi na meron sila dito ang mga geisha. So, yung mga hostess, mga host, sila na yung mga modern day. So, ano ka sa loka? Matutunda siya ko, be. Tapos nakita ko ito. Ito binila, kakabili ko lang. Gamila ako sa rag. Ang ganito. Ng wax. Tapos. Tapos, be, yung nabili ko. Sabi ko, ano po? Hindi pa, hindi pala ito. Tapos, hindi pala ito. Face. So, kaya parang. Dung ba uli ako? Parang binila ako. Face. Ano ka? Hindi rin babasa. Ha? Pag ganitong gabi, actually, akala ko nung umbisa. Pag gabi, medyo wala na mga tao. Pero, 10, 11, hanggang 12, ang dami pa rin tao sa labas. So, ngayon is, uh, alas just pasado na. Ang dami ng tao. Parang ito na yung time para kumain ng mga lokal dito. So, for today's video, then. Actually, mag-ikot ko lang talaga ako dito. Pero, ang pinakagulit ko talaga is mag-dinner. Actually, guys, sa mga goal ko rin dito sa Japan, yung makain ko lang sa mga local na kainan, na kinakainan din ng mga lokal. Kaso, the problem na is the language barrier. Although, pwede ko siya itry mo yun, kaso, kadalasan sa mga gawin, eh, ramen. Um, may isang chokot ako yung sinong copy. Ito na meron, ang meron din mga laki ng kuaka. So, kada din ako maki ako dito. Dito din, hindi, 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 Kumain ako ka, ay, kumain ako ka gabi ba yun, parang 700, ay, 700 yen, 50 pesos, ang drinks na. Dito din ba yun, sa pag-iikot-ikot ako gabi, may mga bar din ba yun. Siyempre, maraming nga rin yung parang mga babaeng, ano, diba, nagpapasaya sa malalamig na gabi ng mga kalalakihan. Yun yun. Ay, ito na dito ba yun. Ay, napili ka na. Sino gusto mo magandang gilan? Hahaha. So, ayun, binag-ikot ako ngayon dito din sa forum para mag-night and night. Binag-ikot ako dito ba yung mga poster ng DC7? Ayun ba yung poster ng DC7, episode 346, Japanese edition. 
Alay, lakas mapangyayari sa lugar na to. I-search ko mamaya kung may posisyon ba dito o mana. Kasi di ba dami mo ba na nakatupis lang yun? Or pure ano lang yun? Entertainment. Ano pa sa entertainment? So meron na makita ng restaurant ba? When I first was recruited, here's what my mentor said, Mr. Shelf. He said, Mr. Owen, you can start this miracle working business part-time. You don't have to go full-time, you can start part-time. And he said, if you'll devote to start with, let's say, 10, 12, 15 hours a week, where you'll start making a profit, here's what you can now say. I'm working full-time on my job and part-time on my fortune. Because profits lead to fortune. I got so excited about that philosophy. I'm working full time on my job, but now I'm working part time on my fortune. I found a way not only to make a living, you won't believe this. I found a way to make a fortune. <laughs> Can you imagine what that's like then to get up in the morning? To go to work on your fortune? Not to go to work to pay the rent, which is okay. But a chance to go to work to make a fortune? And I said, right now I'm working part-time on my fortune and full-time on my job, but it won't be long until I'll be working full-time on my fortune. Can you imagine what life is going to be like? I want you to jot down the magic of part-time. What does it take to really change a person's lifestyle? Not very much. An extra thousand a month, I'm telling you, would drastically change most American families' lifestyles. And that's why part-time is so valuable, because it very quickly changes a person's lifestyle. And here's what the change in lifestyle does. It's a great recruiting tool. One of the greatest recruiting attractions is the money you make part-time. Somebody said, you've been on three vacations this year? Says, yes, I got this little part-time thing going. Says, what's that? You've got two new cars, one for you and one for her. How did you do that? Said, I got this little part-time thing going. You, your kids have got all these new clothes? Yes! All this stuff is happening? What is it? An extra thousand a month. See, a thousand a month full-time, nobody wants to hear your story. A thousand a month part-time, if it starts to change your lifestyle, everybody wants to hear your story. So the key is part-time. The magic and the attraction of part-time gives you a classic invitation for somebody to listen to what you're doing that's changing your life. And it's not just necessarily the money that changes your life. It's what you do with the money. It's the change of lifestyle. So part of it. Wow, these philosophies changed my life. I wish I would have learned them in high school. In high school, if they would have offered wealth one, wealth two, I'd have taken both classes. I wouldn't have waited until I was 25 and broke. Here's the next one. Philosophy to help change my life. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's what you do about what happens. All of us are in like a little sailboat. And it's not the blowing of the wind that determines your destination. It's the set of the sail. So jot this phrase down. It's one of the best to understand. Kids need to understand it. The same wind blows on us all. The same wind blows on us all. The wind of disaster, the wind of opportunity, the wind of change. The wind when it's upside down, the wind when it's favorable and unfavorable. The same wind blows on us all. The economic wind, the social wind, the political wind. The same wind blows on everybody. The difference in where you arrive in one year, three years, five years. The difference in arrival is not the blowing of the wind, but the set of the set. And that's what learning is all about, to set a better sale this year than last year. To set a better sale. The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. second six years, I wound up rich. You say, well, the Democrats must have finally gotten power. No. 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 It was not a political change. Here's what changed the second six years of my economic life. It was my philosophy that changed. The set of the sale of better thinking, correcting the errors of the past and picking up new disciplines for the future. That's all I had to do at the end of the first six. Correct the errors of the past and then pick up some new disciplines for the future. And my total life changed. 
The second six years was totally different than the first six of my working life. And guess who can do that? Anybody. Now, you can keep on the same path for the next couple of years as you have the past two. But if you wish to, if you wish to, and maybe everything's okay for you and you don't need to, but if you need to make some changes, I'm telling you, you can start doing it today so that the next two years will be drastically different than the last two. And anybody who wishes to do that can. And you can do it between ages 40 and 43. You can do it between ages 13 and 50. You can do it between ages 60 and 62. Any two years, any five years that you wish to drastically change from the previous five, you can do it. If you wish to. Now, this, is not, this, this, is, this isn't written. This is not a law. Here's what it's called. Opportunity. But if you don't know, you can change. If you don't know, you can drastically change your income, change your future, change your health, change your marriage, change everything. If you don't know that, some people then go year after year after year after year. Well, how could I make my life better? And if you just rock along, I'm telling you it's okay. Anybody can live any way they choose. But I'm here to tell all of you that if you wish to, it's possible to make the next three years totally different than the last three. And all you have to do is just a few things. So we got that one now. It's not the blowing of the wind that determines your income. It's not the blowing of the wind that determines your fortune. It's the set of the set. And that's why we gathered here today. Maybe I've got some ideas that will help you with a couple of little things about setting the sail of your thinking that might drastically give you multiplying more benefit the next three years than you've gotten in the last two. So it's not what happens. What happens happens to everybody. Chevron years ago brought me in to talk to management. They said, Mr. Brown, you travel around the world and you're fairly knowledgeable. What do you think the next 10 years are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I can tell you, I do know the right people. So they all lean forward and listen carefully. And I said, gentlemen, the next 10 years are going to be about like the last 10. The next season after fall is, boy, I promise you that's not going to change. After day comes, no, I promise you that's not going to change. Here's how the last 6,000 years reads. If you want to make a note of Jim Rohn's vision of history the last 6,000 years, here's how it reads. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. And if we're around another 6,000 years, it's going to read like that, looks like, for the next 6,000 years. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Now, sometimes there seems to be more opportunity than difficulty, and then sometimes there seems to be more difficulty than opportunity, but the mix isn't going to change. After expansion comes recession. But after recession comes expansion. Not to think so, see, is naive. And once you've got just a little of this stuff settled, then you know exactly what to do. You know exactly what to anticipate so you can be ready. Now, here's the next one, and I heard it in my invitation. Here's what it says. For things to change, you have to change. I was hoping the government would change, and taxes would change, and economics would change, and my boss would change, and be more generous. I wished for everything to change. And my teacher said, no, Mr. Strong, for things to change for you, you have to change. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Once I understood this, this altered the course of my life. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. And here's the big one. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. You don't need less problems. You simply need more skills. No. You can't fly without gravity. You have to understand the challenge. But that's the key, is to now develop wisdom to overcome the challenge. Don't wish for less challenge with more wisdom. And then here's one more philosophy to help change my life forever. You can do the most remarkable things no matter what. Humans can do the most remarkable things no matter what happens. Philosophies have changed my life. Here's one of the big philosophies I learned in network marketing. It's called the law of averages. If you do something often enough, a ratio will appear. Key phrase, if you do something often enough, a ratio will appear. It's amazing. It's uncanny. In baseball, we call it batting in. If you talk to 10 people, one says yes. Now the ratio has begun. One out of 
10. Not the 10 get lost. Here's something interesting about the law of averages. Once it starts, it tends to continue. This is colossal information. Once a ratio starts, it tends to continue. If you talk to 10 and get one, sure enough, chances are excellent. If you talk to 10 more, you'll get another. Talk to 10 more, you'll get another. Now you can compete. If you can only get 1 out of 10, you can compete, even with somebody that can get 9 out of 10. If you've been here a long time, you can get 9 out of 10. I just joined, I can only get 1 out of 10. If we have a 30-day contest, I will beat you. So how could you beat me? Here's why. During that 30 days, you talk to 10 and get 9, I talk to 100 and get 10. I beat you. Isn't that clever? This is clever stuff. And I do it for two reasons. I sincerely wish to win. But I do it for another very sincere reason. I wish for you to lose. <laughs> and that's noble on my part. Here's why it's noble. You learn more by losing than you do by winning. So I wish to give you that experience. Now here's how I do it, once I understand uh, the law of averages. When I knew, I make up in numbers what I lack in skill. I make up in numbers what I lack in skill. Now who can do that? Anybody that's ambitious. Anybody with a little ingenuity. Anybody. Doesn't matter. Now here's one more. The law of averages can be increased. You get one out of ten, talk to ten, get another. Talk to ten, get another. The fourth time you talk to ten, you get two. Why would the fourth time you talk to ten, you get two instead of one? You're getting better. You're getting better. And who can get that up three? Now, it takes more than a genius to go past like three or four. But three will do. If you got 300 in baseball, they pay you $4 million a year. Which means you're out seven times out of ten. Seven times out of ten, out. Make $4 million a year. Are you ready for that? So, this works so well now in your business. Just got the phrase down. You don't have to bat a thousand. You don't have to bat a thousand to make big money. One out of ten is fine. Two out of ten is terrific. Three out of ten is bad. Some particular incredible genius might get four out of ten. But three out of ten is sufficient to make you rich beyond your wildest imagination. This is how I went after my friends and neighbors and relatives when I first started recruiting. I said, look, I've got a new business and I'm getting about three out of ten to join. And I don't mind you, just come to the meeting and be one of the seven. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You're my friend, you'll do me a favor. And so it's not important to me that you like it. It's not important to me that you join. It's certainly not important to me that you buy. It's just important to me that you listen. One of the reasons why I want you to hear the story is because a year from now, if I'm doing well, I don't want you to say, how come you never picked up the phone a year ago? I never got a letter, never got a call. You call me a friend? You're making all this money? You never picked up the phone. So I don't want that to happen. So for two reasons, I want you to see what I'm doing. So the year from now, if I'm doing well, I can say, you know, I gave you the opportunity. But also, just as a favor, come and be one of the seven. It doesn't matter to me if you buy or sell. But I need ten to get three. And if you're one of the three, wonderful. If you're not, wonderful. It doesn't. It might matter to you. It might matter to you. But it doesn't matter to me. Now, it matters to me because we're friends. But it doesn't matter in terms of my average. So if you decide to get rich, just learn the law of averages. Starting tomorrow, it'll make a difference. Now, see, if you don't do something starting tomorrow, it'll make a difference. Guess what? It's gonna be the same. <laughs> And see, that way you can guess what the next five years are going to be like. Look at the last 
Right. Choice time. You can do whatever you want. But it's nice to know any day you wish you can change your whole life. What can you do starting tomorrow that will make a difference? Good question. What can you do with economic chaos, massive disappointment? What can you do with a broken heart? What can you do when it won't work? Good question. So if I had a word with you tonight, one-on-one, -on -one, just you and me, I think my personal advice to you would be, this year, 1981, reach down inside of you and come up with some more of those remarkable human gifts. They're there, waiting to be utilized. And then change anything for you you want to change. And I challenge you to do that because you can change. If you don't like how it is for you, change it. If it doesn't suit you, change it. If it doesn't please you, change it. If it isn't enough, change it. And I challenge you to do that because you can change. See, you don't ever have to be the same again after tonight, only by choice. If you don't like your present address, change it. You're not a tree. <laughs> now, let me give you three steps to personal development. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. What does it take to really make the change you're starting tomorrow? It takes more than philosophical pronouncement. I know that. It also takes more than enthusiasm. I know we're hearing a lot about enthusiasm these days, but see, that just won't do the job. We're still here on the old cliches of the 30s, right? To be enthusiastic, you must act enthusiastic. But see, that's not going to help. After you have leaked them out, there are some things you've got to do. <laughs> or it isn't going to change. See, so you can get all excited about lifting 200 pounds till you get to the gym. And then you need a new excitement. And the new excitement is called discipline. Major step to human progress. Discipline. If there's one thing to get excited over, that's it. Get excited over your ability to make yourself do the necessary thing. What could you make yourself do starting tomorrow that would change it all? No! Tell! Now, see, that's exciting. On any given day, you can massively change the direction of your life. Murder is a clear example that any one person on any given day can... You can also commit a positive act and forever alter your life. Whenever you wish. Now, that's exciting. And whatever that act might be that changes your life. The guy finally takes a shotgun to his car and blows out every window, destroys every tire, puts a hundred rounds in this shabby old thing. And he says, I have driven this embarrassing thing for the last time. And not only will I never drive it again, nobody else will ever drive it again. And he lets that shuddering thing stand there for a while as a monument to the day he said, today my life changes. Now who can do that? Anybody. When can you do it? Whatever day you pick. Now here's the key to discipline. Start with the little disciplines, get excited over the little disciplines, and get right on those because those will lead to the big ones. You can't handle the big challenges in life unless you take on the little ones. Make a list of all the things you can do. Get right on those. Discipline yourself for those. Both for the results and for the muscle and for the practice. So that when life hands you some big challenges, you'll be ready. You'll have the muscle. But see, if you don't handle the small ones, you can't take care of the big ones. Okay. Here's what else it takes for life change. Self-motivation. Key phrase, self-motivation. I don't know why we call it self-motivation. It's really the only kind of there is. You've got to motivate yourself. Because I found out you can't change people. They can change themselves, but you can't change them. Lord knows some I've tried. But see, it won't work. 
People have to change themselves. I learned some of those lessons early. I built a little sales organization way back in those early days. I'm 25. And I had some nice people. I said, I'm going to make these people successful if it kills me. I almost died. Right? I mean, you can't do that. <laughs> See, I've discovered this. Good people are not trained. They're found. You find good people. You don't make them good. You find them good. Training really is for the purpose of finding good people. You don't need much instruction for a good person. But too much training probably means you got the wrong people. So you got to find the right people. That's the key to getting a good job done. One of the major things we learn in man management, lesson one, don't send your ducks to Eagle School. <laughs> Eagle hat. I'm telling you, it won't help. It won't help. You can tell whether your school is done any good, right? Is when it's over, right? A duck goes for his first rabbit and makes him a friend. You say, no, no, no. Anyway, so it takes self motivation to really alter your life. And you don't want to give self motivation away to somebody else and make it somebody else motivating you. The guy says, boy, if somebody just come by and turn me on. What if they don't show up? <laughs> See, you've got to have a better plan for your life. Okay. Now, if you're excited and you're ready to change, let me give you three steps to start life change. It can change your life, your personality, your lifestyle, everything can change. Here's the steps. Number one, find out how things work. The first key to doing better is find out. To change your life really, you need ideas. There isn't anything an idea can't change. And show taught me the major problem is lack of an idea, not a problem. At first I didn't have any money. I said to Mr. Show, I don't have any money. He said, that's not a problem. Now see, up until then I always thought it was. Right? I was confused. He said, no, no, the problem is lack of an idea on how to create money and wealth. It isn't lack of money, it's lack of ideas. So if you get the ideas, so you can change anything. Now, to get ideas, you need a constant study of finding out. Now, Shop also said, when you find out something that works, put the information in your journal. Don't use your head for a filing cabinet. Put it in your journal so that you can do the next best thing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Go over it. And if you repeat it, go over it, sure enough, someday, some mysterious day, the idea takes root, starts to grow, and your dress, and your personality, and your lifestyle. But capture the ideas in your journal. Find out how things work. Chuck gave me this word for my life change. He said, study. Great word. If you wish to be successful, study success. If you wish to be happy, study happiness. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Don't leave it to chance. Make it a study. Some people just go through the day with their fingers crossed. See, that won't do it. You've got to study the things that can change your economic, social, spiritual, personal lives. Now, you may not be able to do all you find out, but you should find out all you can do. See, you don't want to wind up at the end of your life and discover that you've lived only one-tenth of it. And the other nine-tenths went down the drain, not for lack of opportunity, for lack of information. So that's number one, find out how things work. Now, here's the best human virtue for finding out, curiosity. Make a note of that. Curiosity. Be curious. You might add a word to it that will help. Childish curiosity. Couple kids here, they want to know something bad enough. Bug you, that's the phrase. They can ask a thousand questions. You think they're through? They got another thousand. They'll drive you to the brink. 
It's a Ubuntu. When you got to know, be like a child. In fact, Jesus, the master teacher, said, unless you can become like little children, you might as well forget it. You don't have a prayer. Excellent advice. you got to be like children. Four ways, in my opinion, to be like a child. Number one is curiosity. Number two is excitement. Get excited like a child over your ability to make yourself do anything you can. Third is faith. Have faith like a child. Adults are too skeptical. And fourth is trust. Trust is a childish virtue, but the rewards are in good. So be like a child. Now, if you're curious, let me give you three ways to find out how to change anything. Any life direction, any dimension. Here's three ways to find out how to change anything. Number one is to read. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They gotta know. They just read, 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 read. Become a good reader. Now that's my opinion. Listen to the other lecturers and listen to me and make up your own mind. Don't be a follower. Be a student. Okay? I say, really, for life change, you got to read. One way to learn is from your own experiences. But another way to learn is from other people's experiences. See, one book might save you five years if you read it. Did you know there's books on how to be stronger, more decisive? Be a speaker, be a leader. Have a better effect on other people, develop your personality. Did you know there's books on that? Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain it? Well, the guy's busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, well, yeah, you run where I work, but the time you struggle at home, it's late. You've got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night, reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you've got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good reader. The whole world is governed by laws. The universe, in fact. Laws. We call it the law of electricity. We call it the law of gravity. There's mathematical laws. There's physical laws. Speed and velocity laws. Agricultural laws. There's all kinds of laws. Now that we find ourselves on the spinning planet, we just have to learn what I call the setup. Learn the setup. Life setup. Now we didn't set it up. We're here, so you got to learn it. And we should learn the setup for two basic reasons. Number one, to keep from getting hurt. That's one of the major reasons for learning, so you won't get hurt. See, economically, socially, personally, you can get hurt just not knowing. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is poverty. Ignorance is tragedy. you got to know, or you're going to get hurt. It's good to know not to walk out of the territory with it. That's excellent information. Now, what if a guy didn't know and he walks out? No, he's dead at the bottom. Somebody says, well, the poor guy didn't know. you got to know, or you're going to get hurt. Now, here's the phrase. You don't have to like the setup. I don't ask you to like how it is. That's not what's important. But it is important to learn how it is. Okay? So you don't have to like it, but you should learn it. That's what I tell the kids, right? Make sure you get the thing to it. What you think about it, that's up to you. What you're going to do with it, that'll soon be up to you. But make sure you get it. See, there's nothing worse than being stupid. Nothing. I mean, being broke is bad. But 
fucking stupid as all. Unless you're sick. Sick, broken, stupid. I mean, that is it, right? There's nowhere else to go. So make sure you get the information. It's key. You don't have to like it, but learn it. If this big monster thing lifts up in the sky, hangs there for a little while, cuts loose, comes crashing down, boom, shakes the ground for five months. And then this big monster thing lifts back up in the sky, hangs up for a little while, cuts loose again, comes crashing down, boom, shakes the ground for five months. It just keeps coming like this big monster thing, lift it up, and then crashing down, boom. Now, you might come along one day and say, that's got to be a stupid arrangement. Which is okay. You're entitled to your opinion. But the first thing you should learn to do is get out number one. That's number one. You might have a great moral argument. You might want to shake your finger at the sky, but do it from over there, right? So you don't get smacked. It's called your basic smart. So number one, learn so you won't get hurt. Whether you like it or not, learn. Now here's the second reason for learning. The setup to benefit. It's called the plus of life. And that's what life is, right? Both minus and plus. The minus is tragedy, heartache, misery, failure, unhappiness. But life is also happiness, prosperity, good feeling. So here's the key. Learn to get on the good side of the way things work. Now, here's two of the basic laws, and we'll take our break. So, taught me these. They come from the Bible. Now, again, I'm an amateur, okay? When it comes to the Bible, I'm not a pro. So, you'll sort of have to take my way of putting it. But here they are. The first one is the law of use. The law of use. And it goes something like this. Whatever you don't use, you lose. Lack of use causes loss. On this planet, maybe not the next one, but on this one. If you tie your arm to your body, leave it there long enough, you'll never use it again. It's over for the arm. Now it may not be over, but it's over for the arm. The only way to keep the use of this arm is what? Keep using it. If you quit, you lose automatically. They don't bring it up for a vote. You lose automatically when you quit. Now, the same thing that goes for your arm goes for your brain, mentality. The same thing goes for all the human virtues. Ambition, unused, declines. Faith, unused, decreases. It's a law. Vitality, unused, diminishes. Energy, unused, decreases. The guy says, well, I'm going to save up my energy. You can't do that. That's like trying to save today, put it on the end of the year. See, you can't do that. They'll come take you away. If you don't use today, what? It's lost. The guy says, well, I'll work twice as hard tomorrow. I'll make up for it. See, that's foolish. You could have done that anyway. Today unused is lost. A talent unused is lost. An ability unused is lost. So here's one of the key expressions of the evening. Take a new inventory of yourself. Starting tomorrow, new project. Take a new inventory. And make sure that all of your talent and ability and mentality and ingenuity and vitality and strong feelings, faith, courage, make sure that all you've got is being used. Otherwise, you lose. Now, one of the best illustrations of the law of use is a Bible story called the Parable of the Talents. Talent story. Interesting story if you haven't read it in a while. Just review it. It's a good story. An ancient story says there was a master with three servants. He got them together one day and he said to the three, I've got these talents. And in those ancient days, a talent was a measure of gold. And he said to the three servants, Take these talents and see what you can do with them while I'm gone. He said, I'm taking a journey and I'll be gone for a while. When I come back, we'll get together, go to the book, see how you did. He said, here's five of these talents for you. Five. Here's two of them for you. Two. And here's one for you. One. 
The master said, take those talents, see what you can do with them. When I come back, we'll get together, we'll go over it all. The servant said, okay, master takes off. According to the ancient story, the master comes back from his trip. When he gets back, he gets the three servants together. And as he said he would, he asks, how did it go with those talents? You're five. What happened? That servant said, well, I took the five talents you gave me, and I put them to work. A little shaky at first, but he said things finally got going. And he said, I poured it on. And he said, my talents grew to seven, eight, nine, ten. He said, I doubled my talent for five kids. Books will show. Master said. Or something like that. He said, I gave you two talents. What happened? That servant said about the same thing happened to me. I put those two talents to work, poured it on. They grew to three and then to four. He said, what happened? That servant said, well, I took the talent you gave me and I carefully wrapped it. And I dug a hole and buried it. And camouflaged it, I suppose, so nobody would see it. And he said, fortunately, nobody got it. And he said, I knew you were going to be here today, so I dug it up. Here it is, safely wrapped. I did not lose it while you were gone. According to the ancient story, the master said, take that talent away from him and give it to the man that's got it. Now you might say, well, I don't like that ring. The poor guy's only got one talent. He's already got it. It ought to be more easy. Remember, I didn't ask you to like it. But this one I would ask you to learn. Because it simply means, whatever you do not employ, you forfeit. It's a law. So learn well the law of use. Now here's the second one, and we're going to take our first one. Second law from the Bible. This one we've heard since we were small, I'm sure. It's called the law of sowing and... Reaping. In fact, we've probably heard it so often we could quote it. It says, whatever you sow, what? You shall reap. Fairly blunt, hopefully clear. Here's my first suggestion on the law of sowing and reaping. Don't try to beat it. You might as well try sitting on the sun in the morning. If you're coming up, you'll have better luck. Whatever you sow, you reap. Now, for a fair share of my life, I'm a bit mixed up on how all this applies. Among a lot of things I was mixed up on. I knew I wasn't reaping too good. That I understood. My problem was I was confused about what was causing it. Remember me with the funny list? I thought those were the reasons why it isn't working out well. And then Mr. Shelf gave me the clue that helped me figure it all out. He said, Mr. Owen, I have another answer for you. There's another way to quote this law that'll show you where the problem is so you can go to work on it right away. All you need to know is what the problem is, then you can go to work on it. So he quoted me the law another way, and I found out what the problem was. Here's the way you quote the law. Whatever you reap is what you sow, what you sow. If you don't like the crop, who do you look up? Answer. Whoever planted it. And where do you find who planted your crop? Answer. In the mirror. What I finally learned to do come fall was to go to the mirror. That's where you go. And if necessary, you say, a few skinny carrots? I've got to be unimpressed. Where were you last spring? Asleep. Didn't you read the book? Did you break your hole? Let me give you seven key points for the law of poetry. Let's take right down to the list of seven, and it'll be break time. Seven points to sowing and reaping. Here's part of the philosophy that really helped me to make some changes in life direction. 
Number one, the law of sowing and reaping is negative. That's number one. Which simply means, if you sow bad, you reap bad. Now this is kind of third grade, but it doesn't hurt to go over the basics. If you plant thistle seeds, you don't get pumpkin. Honest. No, he's looking for pumpkin. John says, how come no pumpkin? Come on, John. The law is negative. That's how come. Now here's number two. The law is positive. Which simply means if you sow good, you reach good. If you plant pumpkin seeds, you don't get thistle. Not from pumpkin seeds. Mother Nature won't pull tricks on you or in the corner snicker and push new thistles and you plant pumpkin seeds. She won't do that. You will get pumpkins from pumpkin seeds, and the reason is because the law is positive. Now here's number three. I got excited when I found out the full dimension of this. See, you do not reap what you sow. But rather, you always reap much more than what you sow. So the third key word is more. You don't get back what you put out. You get back much more than what you put out. And it works both positive and negative. On the negative side, it says, if you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. So you've got to get ready for that, or you will be naive. See, anybody can, whether you will or not, see that. And here's a good question to ask. We are all buying somebody's plan. See, 10 years from now, you will surely arrive. The question is, where? But see, anybody, if you want to, can go searching for a good plan, take it, and start working it. And sure enough, as the time passes, as it surely will, five years from now, ten years from now, then you'll be winding up wearing what you want to wear, driving what you want to drive, doing what you want to do, become what you want to become. But now is the time to fix the next thing. And who can? Yeah. Right. Here comes six. The sixth key to sowing and reaping. This is leveling with you now, as we promised to do. There's one thing better than the truth, and that's the whole truth. And here's part of the whole truth of the law of sowing and reaping. Number six is you could lose. There are times when you just lose, no matter what you do. It's that kind of plan. You reap what you sow, yes, but, what does that mean, yes, but, well, the farmer plants his crop in the spring, takes care of it all summer, loves his family, works 10, 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, he is an honorable man. Come fall, he's got a beautiful crop, and he deserves every day. But the day before he sends the combines into the field, a hailstorm comes along and beats it all in the ground, which means you lose. Somebody says, well, what did he do wrong? Answer, nothing. It's just that kind of planet. Sometimes it's going to hail on your crop and rain on your parade. So you've got to get ready for that or you will be naive. That's just part of the life arrangement. And don't press me. Why? I was not in on some of the original decisions here, so I don't know how it got set up. But there's just time. Sometimes you lose. That's part of life. But now here's number seven. The seventh key to sowing and reaping. And it goes like this. It's just another way to quote the same law. And it goes like this. If you don't That's just another way to quote the law. If you don't sow, what? You don't reap. You don't even have a chance. So if you looked at your game plan tomorrow, you might come to a quick conclusion. I have to get some sowing gold. How true. Get you some sowing gold. And remember, you've got plenty of time. You've got all the time there is. 
Some people spend another day called the Big Seven. I asked a guy one time what his TV cost. He said about $450. I said, you forgot to look at the price tag. He said, what do you mean? I knew he was a TV watcher. I said, that television cost you, in my opinion, at least $12,000 a year. To so watch it. Not to own it. Own it. It's cheap. Watch it. It's what it's and I said, hey, 12000 a year is too much to pay to watch TV. That's too much. Pay a little, but not 12000 And he's the guy that said, I won't pay TV. Okay. We're trying to cover an awful lot tonight. I realize that. But my time schedule is such that uh, we just have to sort of give it all to you and let you uh, sort the rest out. I wish we had plenty of time for questions and answers and that whole thing, but our time is just limited. But uh, we are trying to go through an awful lot, I realize that. But it uh, looks like everybody's getting it. It's about the notebook in this crowd I've seen in a long time. Incredible. Anybody have five pages yet? Anybody? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Incredible. Okay. Maybe you heard the story about the preacher down in Texas, southern part of the country. Um, he was an evangelist back in the horse and buggy days. And uh, he was very good at being an evangelist. And a lot of people used to come here and preach. And one day he put up his tent in one of these Texas towns, expecting a big crowd as usual to come here and preach. And he got there first night of the tent revival, walked in. 7 30, time to start. And to his surprise, the tent was empty. He thought, well, something must be drastically wrong. So he waited till quarter to eight. Nobody showed up. Eight o'clock, set. Finally, eight fifteen, one lone cowboy wandered up on his horse, tied his horse up outside, came in, sat down on the front bench, like waiting for something to happen. The preacher thought, well, at least I better come down and talk to the cowboy. So he walks down and talks to the cowboy, and he says, Cowboy, I'm the preacher. And he said, I don't know what to tell you. Something's gone wrong. He said, this tent was supposed to be full of people. He said, I'm embarrassed. He said, you're the only one that showed up. And he said, I really don't know what to do. And the cowboy said, well, I'm not a preacher, so I really can't tell you what to do. You know, I said, I'm just a cowboy. But if you share, you should share it if there's one or a thousand. So he got kind of inspired by this conversation. And he jumped up on the platform and started to preach. As if the tent was full of people, just explode. And he went for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, just kept rolling. Finally. And when he finished, he came down off the platform and talked to the cowboy. He said, well, cowboy, what did you think of the sermon? And the cowboy said, well, I'm not a preacher. But he said, I know this, if I went out to feed my cattle, and only one showed up, I'd feed it, but I wouldn't dump the whole load of it. <laughs> so anyway, if it seems like we're dumping the whole load tonight, I guess we are, but uh, I'm sure that he's doing well. I'm having a good time. I appreciate the response here tonight. Okay, the next subject is setting goals. Let me show you what turned my life every way but loose. Mr. Show brought this idea on me, changed me completely. Setting goals. Here's what can easily happen if you don't set goals. It's easy to let life deteriorate into making a living instead of designing a life. And we all have a choice. Make a living or design a life. It's easy to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than the substance. That's easy. But the best advice I, I can give you on how to break out of that trap is to learn how to set goals. Mr. Shaw put it to me this way. He said, Jim, if you had enough reasons 
you could do the most incredible things. I never forgot how he put that. If you have enough reason, see, reasons will change your whole life. Mr. Shelf said to me, he said, Mr. Rohn, I think you've got plenty of intelligence, you've got plenty of talent, you've got plenty of ability. Probably what you lack is plenty of reason. He said, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indication of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you're much smarter than your present bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. But of course, my first question was, well, then why isn't it bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reason. You've got enough intelligence. But not enough reason. So see, reasons can change your life. Life has a mysterious way of hanging on to all the innocent. And only gives them up to the people that are inspired by reason. So reasons make the difference in how your life works out. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? Let's go through a quick list called reasons for doing well. First is personal reasons. Some people do well for recognition. Some people do well for respect. Some people do well for the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. Those are good reasons. I have some millionaire friends who keep working 10, 12 hours a day, making more million. And it's not because they need the money. It's because they need the joy and the satisfaction and the pleasure that comes from being a constant winner. And see, it's not just the money anyway. It's the journey, not the money. Once in a while, somebody says to me, boy, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. That's probably why the good Lord sees to it. They don't get their million. Right? They quit. They quit. Okay. Next is family reasons. Some people do extremely well for other people. And that's powerful. Human beings can greatly affect each other. Sometimes we will do things for somebody else we will not do for ourselves. We are made that way. I met a man one time who said, Mr. Owens, do all the things I want to do with my family around the world. He said, I got to have at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a guy's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people that find themselves greatly affected by somebody for personal achievement? And we are affected. The writer of a recent song said, If not for you, the winter would hold no spring. You couldn't hear a robin saying, I wouldn't have a clue if not for you. So we can be affected. That might be one of the most stimulating reasons to do that. Find you. When Andrew Carnegie died, the wee little stockman that built the big steel industry. When he died, they opened up his desk. And on that piece of paper, it said, I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. What a goal. He got so inspired by that goal that the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And the last half of his life, he gave it all away. Good question for me. What's got you turned on? What's got you bombed out of sight to get up early and stay up late and hit it all day? Next question. What's got you turned on? When I 
found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what had me turned off, and I got that cured. And then I got me a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me, 825, they've never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to make something unique out of my life. See, reasons altered my whole life. Now, there's another list for you. Hard little reasons. Sometimes those little reasons are the most powerful reasons that can change your life. Sometimes it doesn't take much. I now carry several hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars, but it was one of those reasons that turned my life around. Just before I met Mr. Show, <laughs> I heard a knock at the door. I go to the door. And there's a little girl standing there about this tall selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. Special deal, several flavors, this whole package of stuff. Two dollars. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. I'm girl. I don't have. And to this day, I can remember the pain of the invaders. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I've been to college, I'm working, I'm 25, I don't have two dollars. And I didn't want to tell her that for some reason. So I did what I thought was next best. I lied. But it seemed to get me off the hook for the moment. She said, well, gosh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And she went away. When she left, I closed the door. And that was the day I said to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I had it with mine, and I had it with you. I've never been to let this happen to me ever again. I promised that day I would work as hard as possible and it always be me. It took me a little while. But now I can feel the going over. And I guess I carry plenty for two. One is the way it makes me feel. But also, in case I don't think we're going to throw stuff so it could be something. I'm ready. I walked out of the Bank of America one time up in Sarasota, California, where I used to live. Two little girls selling candy right outside of the bank. Good. Some girls organization are working for, right? I come walking out of the bank. This first little girl walks up to me. She said, Mister, would you like to buy some candy? I said, I probably would. What kind is it? She said, it's Alvin Roca. I said, my God, that's my favorite. She said, wonderful. I said, how much is it? She said, it's just $2. I thought, I said, how many boxes of that candy you can use to buy? She said, five. And who said that? She was telling him to do it. I said, how many bucks did you get? She said, I've got four. I said, that's done. I'll take that one. They said, really? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's my favorite. I've got them friends. I'll pass them around. They got so excited for all these candy letters. I reached in my pocket and gave them the $18. When I got the candy and they got the money, that first little girl was there. She said, that that she said, Mr. You are really something. How about that? Can you imagine only spending eighteen dollars and have somebody look at you in the face and say you are really something? Now you know why I carry Abby. <laughs> I'm not gonna miss anymore. It was just one of those reasons that changed my life. One of my nitty-gritty reasons was budget. 
find it. Budget finance used to grind my soul. I became Bill, put it into one big impossible video, right? I would get four or five payments behind. This one guy used to call me day and night. I don't think they're not good anymore. Harass me. Threaten to run me in front of the judge. Threaten to ruin my credit. Threaten to embarrass my family. One day he said, we're going to come get your car, drag it rear end up down the street in front of your neighbors. The guy even called me a flake. And back in those days, I'm broke, I'm pitiful, there's nothing I can do about it. But I never forgot how the guy treated me. And when I met Mr. Show, and I got my life started, straightened out, and the money started to flow, that was one of my first projects. But you find it, I poured it on day and night. I finally put all the money together. I always I picked the day for the payoff. And when payoff came, came. I put the money in small bills in a big briefcase. And I walked into the budget finance office on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. The guy who harassed me so often, his guest was about three back. I walked out to the store, sorry, I wonder what I was doing. It. it was the first time I've been there since I brought the money, right? Without saying a word, I opened up this briefcase, dumped this pile of money all over the floor. I said, count it. It's all there. I will never be back. And I turned around and stormed up. Well, that might not be noble, but if you haven't tried it, you've got to one time. It can be the day that turns your life around. All you need is a reason to turn you on. One of my dear friends, Robert, you see, Bobby used to be a school teacher. And Lindsay, Ollie, and Capital. That's the word. Bobby taught school every year. Got a little weary teaching school. One day he decided he wanted to get into sales. So without telling anybody, he just got to get his job to teach school and got to get better. When he did, his job. Put him down. Said Robert lost his mind. Had a good job teaching school. Now he thinks he's a slave. He's going to go see on the great new day. Just put him down. Bobby said, The way my brother asked me when I got to say, he said, That's a good Without dreams and visions, people perish. 
did get it. Congratulate yourself. Self-congratulations is a sign of maturity. Seeking congratulations is a sign of immaturity. But hey, winning and losing you, that's what it's all about. That's the name of the game. Now, some people lead such meaningful for lives. At the end of the day, they don't know whether they're winning or losing. They've got no clue. The guy's just going through the day with his business plan. There's a better way. Okay, here's the third category of goals. Personal development. Put those goals together. Personal development goals. That's your goal is to be stronger, more decisive, be a speaker, be a leader, learn the language, all kinds of skills. The whole weekend seminar was designed to improve all your skills. So if you want away, more skillful. And that's what you want, the personal development skill. That's what attracts, that's what brings good things to your life. The person you become more skillful. Now this is quite a package to work on. Economic things, personal development. For tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, long range. Okay, that'll get you started. Now here's the simple formula for getting there. No, no, I'm going to my user tool. Okay. Work on your goal. That's step one. Work on it. And I put the word work there deliberately. Setting goals. I don't want to say that very I don't want to fix you. We have to come here and let's give it to you. It's work. I know it's work. That's why a lot of people just let it slide. It's work. Many people work hard on their job, but they don't work hard on their future. They just let that slide. And the work involved is making plans. So go home, it's late. You got to buy yourself to watch a little TV. Get to bed. You can't sit up half the night. Plan, plan, plan. And the guys eat. Good work, hard work. But you've got to be better than sincere. Working hard. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good planner. Somebody once wisely said, the people who fail to find the funny thing. Well said. To work on your goals, here's step two. Write your goals down. That's so important. I teach my staff around the world, put your goals in your journal. Because one of the major people you want to study is yourself. And here's the list of goals I put together three weeks ago. Here's the list of goals I put together two years ago. Here's some of the changes I made, rearrangement of my priorities. I scratch these off, I put these on, I've got the eight. Study your accomplishments, study what your desires are. Put them on paper, write them down. Here's another reason for writing your goal there. It shows you're serious about doing better. And to do better, you've got to get serious. You don't have to be serious. But you must be serious. Everybody hopes things will get better. Everybody hopes. Poor people hope. That will tell you something. It means the future does not get better by hope. It gets better by plan. I used to have the affliction called passive hope. It's an affliction. It's bad. Probably what's even worse than that is happy hope. Now that is really bad. That's bad. Happy hope. The guy is 50 and he's broke. And he's still smiling. See, that's not good. So get serious about your goals, put them on paper, write them down. There's all kinds, his goals, her goals, their goals, business goals, financial goals, financial independence goals, family goals. I mean, there's so many things to work on on this. And if you don't get busy and work on it, sure enough, the time will pass. And sure enough, five years from now, you will wind up where you don't want to be, wearing what you don't want to wear, driving what you don't want to drive, being what you don't want to do. Now's the time to <coughs> 
Now here's the third action. And here's one of the important phrases of the evening. Your goals are affecting you, whatever they are. Your goals affect your handshake. Your goals affect your attitude, personality. Your goals affect the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress. All day long, we're being affected by our goals. Now, some people have goals, but they have such long goals. The effect you get. I asked the guy one time, what are your goals for this month? The guy said, look, if I could just scrape up enough money to pay these lousy bills. That would be cool. I'm not saying it isn't a goal. It's a goal, but such a lousy goal, the effect you You don't jump out of bed on Monday morning and say, oh boy, another chance to go and scrape up the money to pay my lousy bills. So you don't do that. Usually you say, oh, not another Monday. And some people have so given up on life, they have joined the clinic. God, God. What? How sad. Surely those are the same people who like to go with them will say, thank God. Let me give you a Bible philosophy to teach you how to get whatever you want. That's the title of the next set of notes. How to get whatever you want. From the Bible. Now again, I'm an amateur. When it comes to the Bible, I'm not a pro. But just like a quote, and I think that'll be sufficient. How to get whatever you want. Here's what it says if you're ready. It says, ask. That's it. End of notes. If there's one art in life to learn pretty well, that's not to be one of them. The art of ask. What does ask mean? Ask me. What do you want? And the formula is staggering. It says ask and what? A guy ought to look into that. He says, yeah, but you work where I work by the time you struggle home. It's late. You've got to be divided up and watch a little TV today. You can't sit half the night and ask, ask, ask. This can do it. Number one, asking is the beginning of receiving. Asking starts a unique process, mental and emotional. I don't even know how it works. All I know is it works. It's like pushing a button and all this machinery starts working. I don't know how. It just works. There's a lot of things you don't need to know how. Just work them. Some people are always studying the roots. Others are picking the fruit. I mean, it depends on what end of it you want in on. Asking is the beginning of receiving, so start the process. Here's number two. Receiving is not a problem. Receiving is automatic. Now, if that's true, receiving is not the problem, but the problem. Failure to ask might be one of your major problems. I don't know. Check it out. The guys are going, oh, now I see them. I thought I'd like to do it every day, but there's not a problem. Good work. Poor ass. We got to take it. Here's number three. Receiving is like an ocean. There's plenty. Especially in California. It's like an ocean here. Success is not in short supply. It isn't ration, and you stepped up to the window and it was all gone. No, 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 no. It's like the coach. 
Now, if that's true, what's the problem? Well, some people go to the ocean with a cheese. Have you got the picture? See, what you have to do in view of the size of the ocean is trade your teaspoon for at least a And you'll look better down at the ocean. Kids won't make fun of you. <laughs> Now there's two ways to ask, and we'll wrap up this thing. Two ways. Here's number one. Ask with intelligence. It didn't say ask intelligently, but I'm sure it meant that. Don't mumble. You don't get anything by mumbling. Be clear. Be specific. Intelligent asking means how wide, how high, how soon, when, what size, what color, how much. Define what you want and describe what you want. That's powerful. In the weekend seminar, we ask with faith. That's the childish part of the equation. Believe you can get what you want like a child. Not an adult. Adults are too So the formula really reads. Make plans like an adult and believe in them like a child. And the most incredible things will happen. Just try it for 90 days. Just try it. You can always go back to the old way. Just try it. Just try it. Just try it. Now, here's the last qualifying phrase on the whole thing, as we promised to qualify it. Again. And it simply goes like this Remember, you won't get. Everything you want. And we've already studied the reason for that. Simply sometimes it hails on your crop and rains on your parade. It's that kind of plan. So you won't get everything you want, but if you will work this goal setting formula, you can get plenty for life and happiness. Okay. That's what I'll say. We use it around the world. We recommend it. Now, maybe it won't work as well for you as it has for me. I don't know. Maybe not. But what if it did? You've got to try. Okay. Here's the last subject, the day that turns your life around. Let me just quickly give you a list of four emotions that can change your life in one day. Emotions are powerful. Sometimes it doesn't take much to alter your whole life direction. Okay, here they are. Number one, disgust. Powerful emotion. Disgust says, I have had it. See, that could be the day. The day you can say, I've had it. And whether you've had it with something small or something major, the day you can say, I've had it, may not be the day it ends, but the day it begins. That's what I said when that little Girl Scout left my door when I'm 25. I give her the big lie, she leaves, I say, I don't want to live like this. And no. I've had it with Ryan and he is broke. The man finally had it with mediocre. He's had it by sick inside note. His wife's going to buy the 37 cent thing, and she doesn't even like the brand. You know why she's going to buy the 37 cent can? To save the The guy sick inside finally says, I've had it. Being on my knees in the dust looking for pennies? We're not living like this anymore. Could be the day to turn the light on. The day you can say, I had it. He walks into his closet and rips everything in it to shreds. And says, I've worn this embarrassing stuff for him. And not only will I never wear it again, no one else will never wear it again. 
Come in and act, it says. I Here's the next one. Decision. And decision making is powerful. And it's emotional. That's those knots in the pit in your stomach, right? Waking up in the middle of the night in the cold sweat. Fine. We sometimes call it inner civil war. What shall I do? Well, for progress, you must decide. The best advice I can give you came from a wealthy friend of mine who said, If it's easy, do it easy. If it's hard, do it hard. Just get it done. If you went home tonight, and in the next few days, clean up a whole list of decisions, that might turn it up in place for the next 10 years. I found this out many times after you've decided getting on with it is easier than deciding. Sometimes decision is the perfect thing. Here's the next emotion, desire, wanting to bad enough. And I don't know how to tell you to want to, that's something you've got to come up with. There's two things I know about desire. Number one, it comes from inside, not outside. You don't send off for it. Number two, I know desire can be triggered by something. Who knows what it might be? Sometimes desire waits and sleeps for something to happen. Maybe it's a book. Maybe it's a song. Maybe it's a sermon. Maybe it's a lecture. A seminar. Maybe it's the conversation of a friend, a happening, an event. Who knows? The best I can advice I can do all is true. Sometimes when the bitterest experience comes to great poison. So let down the barriers, take down the walls. The same wall that keeps out disappointment keeps out happiness. Let life touch you. Don't let it kill you. Here's the last one. This one's powerful. Resolve. Resolve says I will. Two of the most powerful words in the language. I will. Benjamin Disraeli once said, nothing can resist the human will. That will stake even its existence on the extended purpose. Shortly put, I'll do it or die. See, that's powerful. That could be the day to turn to life The world has a strange way of stepping aside when somebody says, I'll do it or die. A man says, I will climb the mountain. They told me it's too high, it's too far, it's too rocky, it's too difficult. It's never been done before, but it's my mountain I will climb it. Pretty soon you'll see me waving from the top. Or dead on the side, because I ain't coming back. The best definition I ever got from the word resolve came from a little junior high girl in Foster City, California, North North. I'm talking to junior high kids with it. I love that kid's definition. They come up with you. I got to the word resolve and I asked, who can tell me what resolve means? And I got several names and they were all pretty good with the last one. Little girl, about her both up. Oh, look, right. She said, what's wrong with this girl? I think I know what we're all doing. I said, darling, what do you think? She said, I think it means promising yourself you will never give up. I said, that's it. Webster, stand aside. That is the definition. Promise yourself you will never give up. I asked the kids, how long should a baby try to learn how to walk? How long? How long would you give your average baby before you shut them off? How long? See, any mother in the world would say, you're crazy. My baby's going to keep trying until it learns how to walk. What a magic point. Now let me show you what triggers all emotions into activity that brings results. And results is the name of the game. Here it is. Action. Finally, you must do something about how you feel. 
It gets you to try harder, read more, set your goals, and go for it. Here's the next attitude disease. Over caution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now, you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I'd be in. I better not call. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life when I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. That's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right, that's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner. We'll cover you with a sheet for the three meals a day. And we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you. We won't let anything happen to you. And you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, yeah, I'd to be 100. But what a way to live. Right. What a way to live, safe and secure. Don't ask for security. Ask for adventure. <coughs> Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's the next attitude disease. We're almost through this month with this. In fact, we're almost through. Hang on. The next one is pessimism. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. The poor pessimist leaves an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out, doesn't see the sunset. You see the speck on the ground. And this is a poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave in his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know all he needs work. He's got five. <laughs> to the pessimist, the glass is all we have. And Indeed. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Oh. Coin with the same measure affects people two different ways. Answer. It all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we take things off. Not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called Better Thinking Habits. One of the major things so taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keep most people poor. Not poor working. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And so taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How often? When you talk about four things that you had me, I used to start the day reading more than you did. I mean, you can do that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd get up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings. 
They whined and cried and griped about the food. They griped about the leadership. They whined and cried because it was too far, too cold, too hot, too difficult, too miserable. I mean, they whined and, whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it to cancel. Or something like that. The story says they died in the desert, never got to the promise. Which I think means two things. Indulge in this long enough to get your future done. And I guess it also means even God himself can only take so much. Just be on the lookout of the things that can destroy all the good you start. The war is on. And this evening, tomorrow, mentally, personally, socially, economically, you got to make sure you're winning the war. And this is part of it. Harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is fine. But if you work hard on yourself, you could make a fortune, which is super hard. Then let's put it in philosophical language. Two things on economic. Mickey, isang mga apap-apap ka, Mickey. Palisin natin si Mano. Mickey! Ayun si Momon, ayaw umakit ni Momon. Ayaw umakit ni Momon. Mickey! Come here. Apap. Hello, Agusin. Hello, Pasipatotoy ng Mickey. Hello, Agusin. Hello, Mami. Hello, Agusin. Hello, Agusin. Hello, Agusin. Hello, Agusin. Hello, Agusin. Hello, Agusin.